having said that, we'll call to order the first <laughs> meeting of June 2020 for June 1st. And if everybody's looked at the uh, agenda, unless somebody's got something to add to it, I take a motion to approve the agenda as written. I'll make that motion to approve the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Katie second it. All those in favor of approving the agenda as written, say aye, please. Aye. Aye. Mike, he's still. Thumbs up, Mike. Trying to connect, I think, by voice. <clears throat> Okay, well, we'll move along. Uh, consent agenda items, minutes, May 18th meeting is the only thing on the consent agenda. Somebody would like to approve that uh, consent agenda, we can move along. I would approve the uh, consent agenda items and minutes of the May 18th meeting. Okay, you want to second that, Katie? Okay, Katie seconded it. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Yes. Okay, public. Is there anybody here from the public? Hey, Chris. Yes. Can Mike hear us? Uh, Mike, can you hear us? If you can, swing, wave your hand. Apparently not. I see him talking into the phone there earlier. Mike, can you hear us? <clears throat> he's trying like heck, but he's not connected. Well, you don't have a quorum until you get him. We want to call him. I can give him a shout, I think. I'm here. There he, oh, there he is. For some oh. reason, technology, I've zoomed a zillion different times, but when I hit computer audio, it says your browser does not support using the computer audio device to use Zoom, install the latest version. But I zoom, I zoomed just last night. That's crazy. Right. I don't know. I'm here. We got you now. Maybe you wore out your Zoom. <laughs> okay, we've gone through approving the agenda and the consent agenda. We're on to the public. Uh, sounds like, Lisa, are you there? Because I have Lisa Scalati up there on the board, but apparently she's not there. <clears throat> okay, well, Hello, then we... Chris. Yes, I'm here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> hey, Lisa. Hi, folks. Hey, Chris. Yes. Can you ask us who else is joining us by phone other than Harry Shepard? I guess there is a couple other people, isn't there? From, you must have uh, I'm on, I'm on uh, both phone and so I can see you on the computer, but my computer does not have audio and video. Okay. And we have, it looks like two more people. Who might that be? Hi, this is Hadley Laskowski from the Valley Reporter. Oh, hi Hadley. Hi. And one other person, perhaps? Is that your phone number, Mike? Which? No. The, uh, yes, that is. OK. 244-6292, that's me. I see me in two different places. Oh, you're all set, Chris. OK. So we're at the public. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak at this point? Guess not. So we'll move right into the select board items. Uh, development review board interviews. There's two positions for development review board, two two-year positions. One is a, for an alternate and one, or, one is for uh, a full term both full terms actually just one's an alternate and one's one's um full board member full board member yeah and 
Patrick Farrell and Harry Shepard are the two people interested in those positions. Um, I guess we'll listen to Patrick first and see what he's got to say. If you'd like, Patrick, tell us why you want to be on the board. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you all for your time. Um, so my name is Pat Farrell. Uh, I live at Five Parker Court uh, in Waterbury, which for those of you who don't know, uh, it's behind Al's service center right next to the fire station. So um, my neighbor, Ann, who I know is very active in the town, was concerned about my ability to stay up late enough for these meetings. That's how exciting my life is. So <laughs> she, she, when I told her I was interested, she's like, are you sure you're going to be able to stay up late enough? Uh, so my wife and I moved here from um, Buffalo, New York about three years ago, and we picked Waterbury over anywhere, you know, anywhere out there because um, we had been traveling here for, for years and loved it uh, and just love the community, love the people, love the businesses. Um, and we both work for the state. You know, I work right in town here and, and walk to work when when that's <laughs> when that's happening. Um, so, you know, I think at, at this point, uh, you know, we're going to stay here and you know, I, I view it as like a duty to be involved in the community uh, if I'm going to, you know, live in it. Um, and, you know, some things I've done to this point, I was on the, uh, the organizing committee for the Waterbury Arts Festival last year and was going to be doing that again this year until it got canceled. Um, my wife and I organized a... Uh, a pub crawl around Christmas time to benefit the uh, Central Vermont Humane Society. So we try and do, you know, fun things that 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 get us involved. But I feel like this is a formal step to to you know making a difference in the community, and that's that's why I would I'd like to do, I'd like to be on the board. So any questions or? Well, I was just going to say you can um, when it comes to doing things fun, you can talk to Mike Bard. He was on the DRB for quite some time and I could probably bet you that uh, it wasn't so fun at times. Is that correct, Mike? Uh, it's a very good board to be in. It's really, you learn a lot about the community and especially it's a very can-do kind of, you see what projects and it's a good way to steer uh, development in, in, the, in the community. So. I, I like that you're dedicated to uh, service. Thank you for for saying that. I, I myself served several years on the DRB and that's how I kind of dip my toes into getting involved in the town. And uh, I will tell you that staying up late at night sometimes is a chore um, <laughs> and the meetings are not always all that riveting, but um, it's a, it's a necessary job and, um, you know, if you've got a good attention to detail and uh, you can be patient with people, it can be quite rewarding. So thank you for stepping up. Absolutely. And that's what I, you know, I definitely look at it as a, a you know, dipping the toe in the water of, and, and a great opportunity to learn about Waterbury because, you know, I, you wouldn't want me sitting in the train station talking to people about the history of the town right now. So I, I definitely need to learn. Okay. Um, any questions for Pat? Any other questions or questions period? You have a good recipe for Buffalo chicken wings. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I could, uh, I have a good recipe for a lot of things, but definitely, uh, we, we could do some wings. Good deal. What, what are your uh, views on, on development as a whole? Um, are you hoping to see more preservation of open land, um, economic development, um, as far as, uh, as far as it's as it's as it's as important, uh, its importance to the community uh, versus uh, overbuilding. Um, my view as a native Vermonter and a lifelong resident of Waterbury and this area, 
Um, I'm a little worried that, um, you know, we may end up overbuilding ourselves to the point where we become, we become too much like Williston or some of these other places that would just, it would break my heart and I would think it would ruin uh, the quality of our community. But that's just my personal opinion, even though I'm in the construction industry. And that's why I probably feel the way I do is because I see what's happening. I'm on the front line uh, and I try to tell people that. And, uh, uh, you know, so it's a double edged sword for me. That's how I pay my bills. But I also am a native Vermonter and I, and, you know, the landscape is very important to me. So I guess to, to answer that question, um, part of what attracted us to Waterbury was the, you know, the sense of history, uh, the, you know, how it looks when you're walking down Main Street. Um, and so, so I think um, development should be, should be done with that in mind. And there's, there, there should be a balance between, you know, progress and preserving what makes this area unique and, and special and preventing what you talked about, uh, you know, with, you know, it, where where we lived in Buffalo, we had uh, a Walmart at one corner of our street, a Target at the other, and a Wegmans and a Tops at the you know facing them. You know, those are both big grocery stores, and uh, you know it, we couldn't get out of there fast enough because it's just gross to look at. So, um, you know, ha having some sort of balance is is really important, but also understanding the the need to to have uh, economic development. Pat, uh, what's your background in like knowing about construction standards, um, environmental law, uh, those kind of things? Do you have any background in either? Uh, I don't. I um, I would have to learn it, uh, which I'm willing to do. Uh, my background is in uh, in human resources um, and um, currently I work for the state as a change management uh, professional for IT projects. So I, you know, I, I, I have a lot of experience with uh, dealing with diverse opinions and, and getting folks to work together. But as you know, I would have to learn the, the laws and regulations. Do you feel comfortable looking at building plans and specs and those kind of things? Yes. Anybody else wish to ask Pat anything? Doesn't appear to be. So Pat, we'll let you off the hook and we'll put uh, Harry in the hot seat for a few minutes. How about it, Harry? All right, well, thank you. Uh, um, I similarly am, uh, have been thinking about trying to get involved a little more uh, with the activities in the town I think I know most of you folks. I'm pretty active uh, uh, with the Water, Waterbury Rotary Club for many years. Um, I live on Jenny Davis Road, uh, which is out the western side of town by the Bolton Dam. Uh, and I work for the town of Stowe as the public works director. Um, I'm a experienced civil engineer. Uh, and um, I think uh, the position on the DRB is uh, something that I could provide some value to uh, to the town and uh, help to um, you know, try to be a productive member of the board and um, uh, hopefully help guide uh, you know, prudent development in the town. So how long you been a member of the, or how long you been public works director for Stowe, Harry? 10 years. Yeah. Is there anything that you've seen happen up there that perhaps you wouldn't want to see here or you'd want to see here in this town? Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to throw a curve at you. But <laughs> no, no, that's fair. Uh, they're very, they're different towns in a lot of ways, even though we're neighbors, um, you know, Stowe is, uh, is a resort community, uh, with a, 
economic engine that relies on heads on beds. Um, and Waterbury's not not quite like that, although maybe has grown that way uh, in some regards, uh, but it's certainly not as intense as it is in Stowe. I can't say that I've seen anything done up there that I, I, I you know, there, there's stuff that's done up there that's at a different scale than what would likely be appropriate in Waterbury. You're not going to have a Spruce Peak type of development, you know, here in Waterbury, although the differences with Waterbury is, is uh, the relationship to the transportation systems and uh, exit 10 and, uh, uh, you know, being the, um, uh, the crossroads, right? The commercial corridor that uh, accesses Stowe and um, links it to exit 10. So um, I don't think that I've seen anything in Stowe that uh, would uh, um, be inappropriate in Waterbury for um, the projects that would be of the kind of scale that might occur in Waterbury. I am a I am a proponent of economic development, um, but I also recognize that things need to be done uh, uh, with balance, um, and I you know hope to avoid uh, or hope to work as a member of the board to avoid adverse impacts to. Um, the butters and the public in general. Joined us, Mark, or trying to? Yeah, I'm here. So we got Harry Shepard on uh, and Patrick Farrell. They're interviewing for the two positions uh, full time in the alternate for DRB at this point. Um, Patrick's already spoken a little bit about why he wants to be on the board and Harry's in the seat right now. Um, you have anything you'd like to ask either one of them? No, since I came in late, um, I'll just recuse myself on a vote, but hi guys, sorry I'm late. That's no problem. Is there any other questions for Harry, anyone? Harry, your civil engineering uh, background will come in invaluable on the DRB. That's probably something, you know, from being on the DRB for a long time, I think that's a skill that could be greatly used on the, on the board. I hope so. Okay. Um... Nobody else needs to pick Harry's or Patrick's brain for anything. We can uh, talk about moving forward with uh, motions to appoint them. This is where it becomes difficult for the board because it sounds like both you people are very um, interested in taking the positions. Obviously one is an alternate. And uh, so I'll ask either one of you right up straight um, would either one of you prefer to be an alternate as opposed to the full-time member at this point and uh, make the board's job easy uh, or we'll have to uh, vote to I'll, do that. I'll just make a comment um, for both of you. From being on the board for a long time, we always use the alternates almost as regular committee members. You know, you don't, you're not any almost less of a board member. And many times when someone's not present, you'll just slip in as, as a member. So it's not being an alternate is nothing, you know, that, that you should not regard as something. And then when a seat does come up, you're probably going to be appointed as a, uh, Full, full board member. So if, if anyone, you know, wants to get in the easy way, an alternate is basically you're, you're on, on the DRB just as you would be a full member. 
I, I would offer that I noted that Patrick had applied before I had, and I'm willing to serve in the alternate capacity. Okay. So Mike, what you're saying is then basically being an alternate is not just a once in a while thing then? No, we always had the alternates would attend every meeting that they could and would participate. You know, they just, you know, <laughs> if they were in the alternate slot, they just wouldn't participate in, in a vote. We, we saw several people uh, do that and did it quite well. And, you know, eventually they wound up coming on onto the, onto the board. So, you know, I look at that alternate slot as basically you're, you're a board member. You know, for you're contributing, you just may not be voting at some particular meeting. And it's probably the best stepping stone for um, becoming a full time member uh, because you basically are next in line, what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. And a lot of times during the summer when the weather's nice and nobody wants to sit in the community room <laughs> at a DRB meeting, um, it becomes quite uh, essential <laughs> to have that extra body. Yeah, there's many a time that we need we need an alternate to, you know, not that we would have a problem with a quorum, but to have a full, a full board on on slate. So yeah. it's usually it's most of the times you you know you're there you might be voting members anyway. Well, Harry, I can honestly say uh, you made our job a little bit easier. Um, I appreciate that. Um, so uh, if somebody would like to make a motion to uh, appoint Patrick Farrell as a full-time uh, DRB member and Harry Shepard as the current alternate. We can uh, let these people go have their dinner. I'll make a motion to approve Patrick Farrell as the full-time member on the development review board, <laughs> Shepard as an alternate member. Is there a second to that motion, please? Second. Katie seconds it. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those who wish to approve the two new board members, please say aye. 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 Well, congratulations, gentlemen. I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank you all and have a good night. Thanks for stepping up. We need all the help we can at times in this town. Okay. Got that taken care of, and now it's all your ball game, Bill. Okay, Chris, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Good to see you. And uh, feels like early April again outside. <laughs> That's good or bad, but it's better than 93 degrees to me. Um, tax due dates. Uh, I did send out an email yesterday afternoon. I hope that you saw it. I guess it was actually quarter of 10 last night. So that's a little bit past yesterday afternoon. Um, the tax due date, uh, we are recommending that we have only one tax due date this year. Um, November 13th, the voters approved uh, two installment. Uh, August 14th and November 13th, but as I indicated, uh, with the deadline for filing income taxes in the homestead exemption forms, or in the homestead declaration forms, we have been informed by the tax department that um, communities that have tax taxes due in August will likely not have information from the tax department in a timely enough basis for us to meet that deadline. So um, Karen Petrovich and I uh, have kind of kicked this around a little bit with Carla to talk about whether we should just push the, October, the August um, payment into September. We talked about having one due date, maybe in October, splitting the difference. But, um, you know, one thing that happens as far as moving the, the final due date up from um, November into October, 
that could be problematic because there's a number of people out there that, you know, start saving their taxes for this year, the week after they paid last year, and they're counting on 52 weeks of being able to put money aside. And if you move the tax date up by a month, uh, you know, they're going to have to scramble around to, to find that money. Um, we talked about, you know, pushing the first date out. Um, that's a little bit more doable, but frankly, a number of people are still struggling right now with their businesses still being uh, very uh, short as far as revenues are concerned. There's a number of people that aren't working. So pushing it to uh, November completely seems the best idea. Um, I almost recommended that we push it even later into the year, but uh, we do have to think about our revenues a little bit and we have a limit on our tax anticipation borrowing from the bank and I don't want to limit if we don't, if we don't need to. Uh, we have other borrowing that we plan to do, but I try to push that off as late as possible so that when we pay uh, principal and interest next year, we're doing it with uh, after tax collection money rather than borrowed money. So our recommendation is to have one tax due date November 13th, the legislation that the House and Senate in Montpelier have approved and the governor has signed allow select boards to make a change. Uh, the final thing is if we move it to November, we don't have to worry about should we waive penalties, I mean interest for the earlier due date. So you don't have to make any decisions about penalties at this point. You still have the authority to waive those if you want. But uh, if we just set November 13th as a due date, there'll be no interest before that. So that's our recommendation. Is, uh, is there any encouragement uh, and would, it, would, would there be any repercussions if for some reason people decided they wanted to try to pay their taxes sooner. Um, obviously it's gonna help us with borrowing less uh, if right. we could get people to do that and uh, it won't mess up the bookkeeping part of it in any way. Oh no, I mean, as, as soon as the tax bills go out, you know, normally our tax bills would go out in the first couple of weeks of July. Certain, they have to go out 30 days before the first due date. So in a normal year, we would send out tax bills around July 10th or so. Um, and very typically, once the tax bills go out, people start to pay. You know, the, the joke is that, you know, elderly people come in and pay their full tax bill uh, the day after they get it. And when we ask them why, they say, well, you know, we don't want to die and owe, owe taxes. So let's get it out of the way. Uh, we'll take anybody's money anytime. If people want to come in now and pay taxes, Karen has the ability to to take that as a prepaid tax, and, and that's not a problem. So this doesn't cause any bookkeeping issues for us. It will push off uh, our revenue uh, stream, but uh, we're dealing with that anyway. And it's it's I think it will be better for the for the taxpayers and for for our shop here. Um, I certainly don't want to try to keep the August deadline because if we do that, we're certainly going to have to uh, print a whole bunch of corrected bills because of homestead filing that comes in late. So uh, the August deadline is not possible at all. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Bill no. at this time? Bill. I'm, yep. I'm, all, I'm all in favor of moving the date to November. The one thing is, how much is it going to cost us in additional borrowing just to move that? Is is it going to be a substantial amount of interest that we're going to pay? Uh, well, it won't. I don't. I, I didn't calculate that, Mike. Um, you know, it's not a huge. We budgeted. Um, for debt service, we 
We budgeted $5,800 for interest for tax anticipation borrowing. So even if it even if it triples, you know, it's $10,000 more. Uh, I don't think it's going to be anywhere close to that. But um, you know, it's we'll be able to manage the interest rate. It's 1.8% that we're paying on that uh, when we borrow the money. And uh, I don't see that as a major obstacle. Is that it? That's all, all I'm concerned with. You know, uh, I think it's a good idea for people. But again, as I think what was presented, if we could have people, if they can pay their taxes early to help the town, you know, you know mitigate some of the borrowing, that'd be great. So, Bill, is that a is that a term uh, like a short term note of sorts uh, that's based on the fact that it gets paid off when at the end of November? Is that how that works? And what happens if, for some reason, taxpayers, let's say a small percentage, you know, 15, 20 percent, that's not small, but it's not huge either, don't don't have the taxes to pay, um, then what happens if we kind of over, override our limit or a yeah. So um, back, in, back in March, I think it was, the select board approved a uh, line of credit from the People's United Bank. Um, I think it was a $1.8 million line of credit or $1.4 million line of credit. And um, we pay interest on what's outstanding. So, you know, for several weeks we went by, we didn't borrow anything, no interest. We, you know, we borrowed fifty thousand um, dollars. We start paying interest on that. Um, the the uh, line of credit, I believe, has a um, like early December uh, payoff date, <clears throat> and. Typically, we end the year with about a 98 or 99 percent collection rate. We do quite well in a normal year in terms of collection. I expect it will be a higher delinquency rate this year. Um, we came into the year with a fairly healthy fund balance, so we would have to have delinquencies that are in excess of you know, everything being equal, if we end up with a balanced budget at the end of the year uh, and, and the expense side, we would have to have delinquencies that exceed the couple hundred thousand dollars that we had in the, in the bank. Um, we will be borrowing other money, you know, for the fire truck and things like that. So the likelihood that we can't pay this tax anticipation note is small. Uh, but if it should come to pass, that we can't pay that note, then we would have to work with the bank and do what they call current expense borrowing, and then would have to fund that deficit for next year and plan on it next year. The, the world won't end if, if we can't pay it off. Uh, my expectation is that we will be able to pay it off, however. I didn't know if there was a like a penalty of sorts uh, if you don't make the deadline or whatever. No, they, I mean, there's no penalty. Certainly, certainly the bank wouldn't like it. I think in a year like this, given the circumstances that all municipalities and all governments, frankly, are facing, the bank would, would understand uh, we're pretty good credit risk for the bank. They've never, you know, we've never missed a payment, never missed a payment of principal or interest. Uh, to any of our creditors, so I, I think that would be okay. And and it's it's unlikely that we'll find ourselves in that position, Chris, unless it's a really really bad uh, uh, tax collection. Chris, just to give you a little comfort, I'll put on my old um, banking hat. Uh, people, bankers, you know, when they bought, they lend to communities. It's based upon the good faith of the community and banks never worry about those because it's very rare that a community goes bankrupt. So they're always willing to work with community in a short shortfall. And especially this year with COVID, you may see that banks working with communities 
who do have shortfalls, but I tend to doubt there's going to be any financial problems with any financial institution, you know, you know, with municipal lending. Right. Well, the, the, the um, skeptical side of you, Chris, when, when Mike says that, uh, you know, the full faith and credit of the municipality is behind the loan, that means the bank knows the, the law says the select board has the unlimited ability to tax the grand list to pay the loan back. So you can raise the tax rate as high as you need to raise it and the people have to pay it or you can take the property away. So yeah, one of these days, right? <laughs> there you go. You need more money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's hope it doesn't come to that. Yes. Maybe you'll have the rioting like they do out, out in uh, Minnesota or wherever. Okay. Uh, if there's any more comments or questions there on the tax due dates, we can move to our next item. No, you got to make a motion to set one tax due date. Okay, I didn't realize we were doing that at this meeting. Um, yeah, I think I think it would be helpful if we can set the date now. That's for November. Um, yeah, we'll we'll have to set a tax rate at the time, but I think it would be good to get the information out. There are already people calling Karen about, you know, tax payments and everything. It'd be good to have the information out there. So what day did you say in November, Bill? 13th. 13th. Okay, then. If somebody would like to make a motion to officially set the tax due date for 2020 on November 13th, we can move ahead. And if you'd have the motion, you don't, we, we can fill in the language, but I'd like your motion to have the same language that the voters put in saying that the taxes have to be paid in hand by, you know, when the office is open and everything else, so that there's nobody that comes in and says, well, November 13th, uh, I got here at 10 minutes of midnight, it's still the 13th, so. Well, somebody, will, somebody will have to language. do that as moved then because I don't have that motion in front of me. Yeah, you don't have to worry about it. If you just acknowledge that you're you're going to use the same language that the voters approved at town meeting for that due date, we can fill that all in. There you go. Not you, Nat. We can see your mouth moving, but no voice. Yes. There you Hello. go. Hello. So moved. <laughs> Thanks, Nat. All right, is there a second? I'll second. Mark mm -hmm. Fryer seconded it. Any further discussion? Seeing none, hearing none, all those who wish to approve the new tax date as November 2020, <coughs> uh, please say aye. 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 Okay, discussion need for animal control officer who goes around comes around did you all get my memo that i sent out last night yep okay um we haven't had an animal control officer really since uh mr town over in duxbury there was one woman i can't remember her name carla but there was a woman who owns a kennel up on camel's hump that agreed to be the ACO when uh, Mr. Town got finished. Um, and she didn't last very long because she evidently th didn't think the phone was gonna ring too much. And we haven't had one, and I think that was last fall, right, Carla? Yeah. Right, that was uh, Andy McMahon. And actually, I think she thought the phone was gonna ring too much. She thought sort of Zeb underplayed the amount of work that he had to do. Yeah, that's what I said, that oh, okay. the, the phone rang too much for her. Right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we do not have an animal control officer now. Uh, with the warming of the weather, uh, more and more people are outside. Uh, dogs are out. Uh, we've had a number of calls uh, and a number of incidents. We have a whole lot of people um, kind of up in arms about when the dog park is going to open. Now that's an EFUD facility. And um, just as an aside, I talked to Nick 
uh, NATO, the rec director, uh, just before the meeting. And, you know, we have taken steps to open the dog park, but it's, it's very limited. It's one person and one dog at a time. Um, the CDC is still recommending uh, very tight restrictions on dog parks. So anyway, there's a lot of people out and about with, with dogs, and um, we don't have anybody that can uh, respond to complaints or concerns, whether it be barking dogs or dogs chasing animals or dogs fighting with other dogs or, or bad interactions between dogs and people. Um, we need an ACO. Uh, you know, I'm already the deputy health officer that takes uh, way more time than I really can spend on it. I don't want to be the ACO or a deputy ACO. And the last couple of weeks, Carla and I have spent a lot of time dealing with animal stuff. Um, as you could see from my email, we really have never paid an animal control officer. And that may be one reason why uh, nobody wants to do the job because it's a thankless job and, uh, you know, to get paid for your mileage and a small stipend for taking a call um, doesn't seem worth it to me. So I'll stop there and let you folks discuss it. Anybody? Well, we had an ACO there at one point, Peter Tamel, and uh, he probably brought things under control in as short a time frame as anybody had in the past that I can remember. And uh, I don't do Facebook or front porch form, any of that stuff as of yet, but I've been told by a few people that there's been uh, many many comments on on uh, those those forums about dogs and uh, complaints about dogs and and uh, I guess it seems to be getting out of control again uh, I'm actually doing work for Peter Tamel um, I could let him know that you know, depending on what the board decides tonight, that uh, um, that position is is open again, and whether or not he might be interested in it. Um, yeah, I mean, the board needs to decide whether we're going to. Correct. You know, we want to fill the position. We need to advertise for it. We can't just hand it to somebody. I would certainly. No, I would want him to apply. Recommend advertising and, you know, maybe as early as your next meeting, there'd be somebody available to uh, potentially, um, potentially um, appoint a position. No, I just would ask if he might, might be interested in applying for the position again. I wasn't. No, no, I understand. That we turn the, <laughs> the job over to him. Uh, he may already have a full plate anyway. Um, but, but it's more, yeah. what are we going to, you know, if we advertise for the position, people are going to want to know what the compensation is. Very few people are going to do something for nothing. And, you know, we had a couple, the last couple, Zeb Town and the... <clears throat> from Duxbury, um, you know, we didn't pay them anything. Um, Zeb said he didn't want to be paid, but we didn't have very much that we could offer. And I, I'm concerned that that's part of the problem. I mean, how, how does the rest of the board feel about what's going on in the town as far as dog issues, good, bad, ugly? Um, do you think it's getting to a point where we we need to up the ante uh, to try to get somebody on on as ACO? I mean, I, well, I have a yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, I have a couple of questions. One, maybe for Bill, if he knows what other towns pay their animal control officers. I am a little c concerned about paying. $500 a month. That's 
I don't know. That just seems a, a, a little rich, but I have never been an animal control officer. I know you, you're faced with a lot of different issues, and I'm, I, I think we may be seeing a little higher amount of animal issues, maybe due to some COVID stuff. You know, people may be because they're not feeling they're able to get out. They're letting their animals out. So I don't know if this is something that's a short-term problem. But, and, you know, we, we had, I know there was a person who respond, who wrote to all the board members about that the dog park not being open. That would probably potentially maybe help a little bit where they would have some place to let the dogs kind of roam around. So I know I said a few things there, but I'll let anyone respond or Bill respond. Bill, Bill could respond on the, you know, average costs that other towns may be paying. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that Mike. Um, I do know that Chris, I believe was on the board the last time that we, uh, wrote the dog ordinance. Uh, maybe it was done just before he came on, I can't remember, but we have a pretty robust dog ordinance now. Uh, very uh, stringent, you know, dogs are allowed in parks, but they have to be on leashes, they can't be on playing fields. And, uh, you know, I look out my window all the time and, and there's people playing with dogs on all the fields and, if you're going to have an ordinance that says that, and right now it doesn't really matter much because there's no sports on these fields, but the idea is, you know, you want to keep the dogs off the fields because you don't want the dogs defecating, you know, in left field and then somebody's out there diving for a softball and, you know, they're, they're in it. Uh, and you need, if you're gonna expect that to be enforced, you need somebody who's gonna be willing to walk across the field and confront someone. And you know how it is, even with police, as, as time goes forward, you know, there's more and more people that are more than willing to say, hey, you know, I don't agree with this law. The, the guy who wrote about the dog park, you know, um, this is public land. You don't have the right to close it. I'm going to use it. I don't care what your rules are. You know, that's not a town facility, but that's kind of, uh, you know, I think that's still um, an outlier kind of attitude, but it's certainly there's a much greater willingness to get in the face of somebody who's uh, in a position of authority than I remember certainly growing up and early in my career. That, that seems to just be a little bit more of uh, the MO of, of people these days. So maybe 500 is, is too much. You know, that's, that's $6,000 a year. Um, but, you know, um, if, if I spend 40 hours doing it, uh, you know, in a, in a couple week period, if I spend a week, you know, that that's a couple thousand dollars of my time that's being spent. And, uh, you know, you got to add Carla's time to that as well. So, I mean, it's not 40 hours last week. I don't mean to imply that I spent 40 hours in the last couple of weeks or not, but when, when I have to get involved with these kind of things, it, it, it's, it's an opportunity cost, you know, I'm doing this and as opposed to something else that I can be doing. And if we're going to have an ACO, I'd like a person who has the skill set, the temperament, and the, you know, the time and will be willing to put into it. And I think you get that when you offer somebody some reasonable compensation. And again, maybe 500 is too much. Maybe it should be 250, 300. I don't know. We can advertise and see what we can get. But the point is, we got to do something different than we're doing now. Yeah, so, the only reason why I say 500 may be too much is you look at what the compensation for a lot of other, you know, positions are, and they're a significant amount less. Granted, as you said, 
you probably have to have an idea, not like a law enforcement background, but, you know, dealing with people who have dogs off leash and stuff like that, that's a tough thing. People get pretty belligerent, and you have to have the right person. So, you know, I don't know what the right number is, but I'm just thinking that $500 is maybe a rich, you know, maybe half or, you know, 250 or 300 a month. I think that's probably a more reasonable level. Mark, are you able to speak there? Yeah, I just threw it in the chat. Um, you know, if we did it on a weekly, if we did 50 to 100 per week, it'd be 2,600 to 5,200 a year. Um, you know, maybe we advertise it as a window and we see who comes our way and see who has what experience. And maybe that's the window that we offer. I don't know, Phil, if it makes sense to offer a window or if we just need to set a, a, an, an amount. But I, I, I do think we need to have somebody in that position. I think there's quite a few dogs and another animal activity in town. And if we're going to have rules around it, I think we need some kind of enforcement arm to it. Or, or I mean, basically, it's pointless to even have the rule. So like always in the past, one of my bigger concerns is, uh, you know, to Mike's point, you know, an ACO can sometimes get himself into situations that nobody would want to be in, uh, confrontational, uh, volatile, uh, and sometimes dangerous. And, uh, you know, the bigger problem for me is I don't mind paying the money to, uh, to solve this problem if we can actually somehow solve it. Um, you know, I think our hands are tied a little bit when it comes to, uh, enforcement, you can really get into the weeds on avenues that you'd have to go to, uh, get somebody to, to comply. Um, I wish there was a shorter, easier way of penalizing the bad people because it's always the violators that cost the good people money. You know, the people that do the right things in sometimes you walk out on the street or you're driving down the road and you see visually some people got their dogs on leashes and others got their dogs just running. Um, You know, it's one thing to hire somebody to do this, but how do we either change our ordinance or maybe it means speaking with a lawyer about um, what we can do from a financial standpoint as far as finding people uh, and making them accountable for doing the wrong thing rather than just taking, you know, good people's money and, and throwing it at a problem that you just can't solve. Carla? Yes. Um, it's been a while since I've actually looked at the ordinance. Do you remember if the ordinance is written in such a fashion that the ACO can, can write tickets, you know, that we use the Judicial Bureau? I believe it is because like Peter had a, a book of tickets and I'm not sure that he ever wrote one because it's a onerous process, but. Yeah, I mean, I believe, I believe Carl is right. I believe the, the ordinance is written in such a fashion that the ACO has the ability to write a ticket for violating the ordinance. There's a, there's a section of fines in the ordinance. I believe there are what's called waiver penalties that, you know, if you agree to uh, pay the fine without contesting it. You know, if the fine is 50 bucks, you end up paying 25. Uh, those tickets, when they're written, go to the Vermont Judicial Bureau. Uh, you're supposed to pay the Judicial Bureau and ultimately some of the money will come back to the town. Um, I don't think we should ever view an ordinance and its enforcement as a revenue source for the town. Whatever revenue comes back, help offset the costs of having the ordinance. Um, but I, I think it's a pretty robust ordinance. And, you know, I think Peter did a pretty good job overall. Um, I think as we all know, 
Um, you know, Peter's a unique individual and has a particular style and some people warm up to that and others don't. Um, and, you know, I don't know, I talked to him months ago about this and, and my guess was that if it was something that he felt that uh, he wasn't taken, being taken advantage of, he might be willing to uh, throw his hat in the ring again. But I'd like to advertise it and see who he might get. And if Peter applies and other people apply, then the board can weigh the options. Um, but uh, it should be a board appointment, I think. Uh, I don't believe that uh, this is something that um, the manager appoints. Well, I wasn't certainly wasn't looking for a revenue stream. I was just looking to how we can get the violators to stop violating without yeah. costing innocent people, you know, more tax dollars. That's just so unfair, right? Uh, in my eyes. So, well, I think you know, Mark Mark Fryer's um, idea. We can advertise and. We can advertise and say something to the effect, you know, compensation uh, depends on qualifications, something like that, and we can we can then negotiate. But I think it's I think it's going to need to be a consistent amount of money in order to have the person feel like their time is being compensated. That it's not simply they got to wait for a complaint. Uh, I think we're going to want this individual to do a little, I don't, I don't want to say patrolling, but I think the ACO needs to kind of be observant when they're in the community and when they see a violation, they should intercede. So if they see somebody on the rec field or if they see somebody walking down the sidewalk without a, without a leashed dog, they should stop and deal with it as opposed to, uh, you know, waiting for somebody to call and, and complain about that. So I think that you want to uh, have some compensation to let the people know that you're expecting them to, to be a little bit proactive as well as reactive. So I don't want to sound like I'm beating a dead horse. So my bigger concern, and I'll, and I'll say it one more time, is that uh, I don't mind spending the money to to hire somebody to do the job and do it right. Uh, my bigger concern is um, curbing the violator, somehow getting them convinced that they can't, you know, the minute the ACO uh, confronts them and tells them that they're doing wrong or whatever, and the minute he turns his back, they go back to doing the same thing. That's not getting us anywhere. That's just you know, we're going to continue to throw money into a, an abyss uh, unless we can somehow sting these people to the point where they finally get it and uh, start doing the right thing. Um, so I got no problems. You know, 500 bucks wasn't really off the wall for me if it if it somehow made it, made it so that uh, we corrected the problems that we were seeing. Um, and that's why I didn't know what kind of, you know, you seem to think the ordinance is uh, strong enough. Um, I think it is. I haven't seen it in a while, so I have to take your word for it. So. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, tomorrow, either Carla or myself can send it out. I think you're the only one, Chris, that maybe has ever used it. But we'll send it out to all of you so you can see it. If you believe that there needs to be amendment to it, that's a process that, you know, takes a little time. I'd like to be authorized to go ahead and advertise for the ACO and try to deal with that aspect of it first. And if you want to tighten things up or make the ordinance stronger, that's a secondary step. And, you know, that will take a little time to happen, but. Right. Well, if I remember right, Bill, and, and you can correct me, um, I thought we had instances where we were fining people and, and not, <laughs> we just weren't paying the fine. And in order to uh, pursue that, because I think at one point I'd talked about if they were residents of Waterbury tagging it to their property tax, so they'd have to pay it or be delinquent. But uh, 
that seemed a little bit off the wall, I guess, to some people. Uh, yeah, I don't remember those kind of issues. Um, you know, it, it's a civil fine. It's a civil penalty. Um, if you have to, you can take them to small claims court or, or go to court to try to compel them to pay. Um, and I understand that, you know, the payment of the fines is, is important, but I think the first step to doing that is to get somebody who can be out there and, and try to enforce the ordinance. So I'd like to yeah. trade on that. And then when we, when we hire the ACO, we can talk to that person about, you know, what, what they might be able to do. And, uh, we can tackle your your concerns in a second phase, maybe. Right. Yeah. You know, somebody had also mentioned to me because I was kind of chit chatting about it there. Um, in order to pay for this additional expense to the town, or added, you know, increased expense, um, that we raise the price of dog licenses. And to me, it goes back to what I said earlier. I don't. I'm not looking to punish the people that are doing the right thing. I think that's set by the state, isn't it? There's only a portion of it that's set by the state. So I think the board can increase. Oh, okay. Fees. So I guess that that is an avenue that we could look at um, if we had to. To, to, be, to me, I'm a little bit concerned about if we do have a new animal control officer, and I think we probably should, uh, I, I would like it to have someone who has a good sense of judgment. I hate to penalize someone whose dog's been off the leash once, you know, and I don't want this to be a big revenue stream. You know, if the animal control officer talks and explains, hey, you can't have this animal, you know, I'm looking at more of the habitual, you know, you know, abuser. And as Chris kind of said, is I hate to charge everyone, you know, because there are a lot of very responsible dog owners, you know, around. And sometimes every dog owner, their dog will get off off leash or something like that. And those things happen. And I, I just don't want, you know, you know, it to be a real dog police kind of situation. I want it to be something that's, you know, a, a manageable kind of working. Yeah, I, I think those are all things you can touch on in an interview, Mike, when we, when we get somebody who might be interested, you can bring those kind of things up then. It's certainly a, a relationship that, you know, we want input from the select board. You know, it's, there's gotta be a lot of communication between the ACO uh, staff, Carolyn, myself in particular, and then, and then the board in terms of what the expectations of the, of the public are, but I think if um, my, the consensus I'm hearing is we can move forward to advertise, we'll leave the compensation kind of open-ended and the board can decide that when the time comes to uh, actually hire somebody. Well, to that point then, um, <laughs> anytime we've advertised in the past, if there's no form of compensation suggested, do you think we'll get any more interested parties than we did before? <laughs> I think we will. Okay. Anybody else out there that's joined with us here tonight that wants to make any comments on this? I would just say that I'm surprised that we hadn't had <laughs> someone already in place to do this. And I think that it is a big problem around here. I witnessed it just last weekend. And I was walking down the street and I was near the park, um, the Frisbee golf course and people have their dogs with them off leash there all the time. They went across those fields and both those um, dog PC bag holders were out and the person hadn't brought a bag. So they just left it and said, oops. So I think it's a common problem. And um, I think $500 is a little steep, but I mean, if we look around other towns, see what they have. And then if we have interested parties who have had the position before, maybe, you know, give a stipend based on experience. But I think we should probably start out the lowest we can do. And then if the calls are ringing off the hook as much as you say that they are, then maybe we can go up on a 
yearly basis, but I agree that it's it's not uh, Bill or Carla's job to do that after they've tackled so much already on town business. Well, I know compared to to not much what we've paid in the past, five hundred dollars a month sounds a lot, but you know it's one hundred and twenty five dollars a week, and uh, you know if people are you know figuring they're going to make you know, at a, at a job, fifteen or twenty dollars an hour. They got to take phone calls. They got to go out in the middle of the night. It's it's really not that much money. No. Um, you know, it's you you want to <clears throat> pay someone so that they don't feel an abused <clears throat> to do the job. And if they get a, like I say, if they get a call that there's a dog bite at ten o'clock on a Saturday night in a snowstorm, they're going to have to go out. So it's, it's more than we're used to paying, but in the end, it's with social security and everything else, it's, you know, $7,000 maybe. Yeah. Well, if anybody doesn't want dogs on their property, there's a one, I'll give you a one tip. All you gotta do is get a couple of chickens. <laughs> Because if they if the dog attacks the chickens, you got right to take matters into your own hands. Right. But well, hopefully we'll have some success <laughs> with advertising and um, maybe kind of head in the right direction on this. Okay. Way. Thank you. All right. Next on the list, Bill, uh, uh, amend, the, amend refund policy for the recreation program. Yeah, the town, the town has a policy that uh, if people sign up for recreation programs, typically, you know, sign up day starts on um, uh, town meeting day, they have to pay, a, I think it's a $50 uh, deposit, and then they have to pay their full payment by a certain date. Some people have already paid that full uh, amount of money. Some people have paid only the deposit. Some people have paid uh, a little bit in between. Uh, we are having people who are asking to, um, who are canceling their children's participation in the program because of COVID. They don't feel comfortable uh, having their kid go this summer. And I think given all of, um, uh, you know, that reality, that it's really unfair for us to say we're not going to give them a full refund. I would recommend that we, uh, that you amend the policy for 2020 to allow uh, full refunds to be given to anyone who asks um, to uh, have their child uh, removed from the role of the uh, rec program before it starts. And then uh, once the program starts, if, if people at that point decide, uh, oh, this just isn't working out, we don't, we don't feel safe for, for whatever reason, uh, once the program starts, I would say we would give them a refund on a pro rata basis. And if they, go to the program on any one day in any week that they have to pay for that full week. But um, it's really for the, the deposit that this is most applicable to. So in other words, your, your motion is going to basically say that uh, they get a full refund if they pull their child prior to the start of the program and then a prorated refund based on yes time spent or yeah and I, I think you know in terms of uh numbers i don't think this is going to hurt us very much uh as far as i remember from last talking to nick there were still people on a waiting list i don't think that this is going to hurt the town i do think it's just uh the right thing to do for people in these circumstances that if they just don't feel like they want to have their child attend, I think we should just give them their money back, no questions asked. So the guidelines from what I understand for opening daycares, and not that it's relevant to this, but it is somewhat, um, 
from what I was told, and I don't know if it's what truth is behind it, but uh, Bill Minter's daycare that he runs operates up there in Stowe, I forget the name of it, was the only one that opened up uh, today because today was the opening deadline, basically. Uh, apparently, um, the guidelines were so stringent uh, that a lot of the daycares around the state felt that they couldn't meet those guidelines. Um, do you suppose that rec programs would have similar guidelines? Yeah, I, Nick, Nick has been very, uh, very uh, cognizant of the regulations. He stays very close to what's coming out of the governor's office. Uh, you know, there's uh, lots of cleaning that has to happen. There's, um, you know, social distancing, uh, you know, how much space that they can take up. He is still quite confident that we can run the rec program. Uh, looks like we're going to use uh, the scout hall over at the uh, Anderson Field for the youngest of, of the group. Um, the, uh, the bulk of the elementary school or primary school program will be held at St. Leo's Hall. Uh, we've made arrangements with them. Uh, the ICE Center, by the way, did agree to host us um, if we wanted to, but Nick, uh, Nick felt that the uh, facility at St. Leo's in terms of the number of classrooms that they had in its a more centralized location was, was a better deal. Uh, and then the older kids will be at the Wesley Methodist Church. So we'll have three locations going, mm -hmm. and obviously staff will have to be split up. But I talked to Nick this afternoon before this meeting, and, and he's pretty geared up to uh, and pretty ready for meeting the requirements that have been set for these rec programs. Um, on, a, on an aside, a piece of good news, um, Nick had talked to me a couple weeks ago and through this CARES Act and, the, and all the uh, legislation that's passing uh, or being worked on in the state, um, I told him to go ahead and apply for a grant and he did a good job in, in uh, putting the, the grant application together. He got it in on a timely basis. We just found out last week that we were awarded, I believe it's $33,000 uh, that we're gonna get. And the grant is to help pay for all of the extra cleaning materials that we need, potentially, you know, if we have to pay rent where we didn't have to before. I don't have all the details of that yet. I did not convert that into the budget report that I gave you the other day. Um, and uh, we don't have a grant agreement yet, but uh, we have been told that we've received that. So mm -hmm. I, I think we're gonna be able to run that program, Chris. Okay, it's gonna be a little bit of a challenge, but in general, it will, it will, be, uh, it will be something that we can do. I'll be uh, interested to see how the kids react, um, you know, how, they, how they'll tolerate uh, the extra, <clears throat> you know, the masks and all the other things that are involved in going to the rec program and how many of them will just, you know, after a few days, will just say, mom or dad, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I'm not even sure whether the kids will be required to wear masks. The counselors, I believe, have to wear masks. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll have to it's like everything else with this. We'll just have to, you know, play it by ear and do the best we can and learn from it. And yeah. You know? Yeah. No, it's a, it's a totally new, uh, it's going to be a totally new experience for a lot of people. And uh, yeah. I hope it, I hope it works out well. Nat, okay. you want to say something? Good luck, Nick, on socially distancing kids. That's going to be I think that's going to be a challenge countrywide in, in camps and stuff like that. That's just yeah, it, be it will be. So uh, we do need a motion to uh, amend the policy to allow full refunds. I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, 
uh, amend the existing uh, refund policy for the recreation program to provide for full refunds of their deposits. I'll second that. And included in that motion, Mike, is for the pool as well. We're going to talk about the pool in a second, but could you include the pool uh, in sure, there? Sure, I would. I would include that. Okay, thank you. What's the pool? What's the pool thing? The refund policy applies to the pool as well as the rec program. Yeah. Motion been made. Um, to revise the um, policy for the recreation program and the pool for full refunds and um, prorated refunds, full refunds prior to start and then prorated refunds after it's in session based on time spent. Motion has been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Can I just ask, Bill, <clears throat> what was the reasoning for like the Ice Center's change of heart and letting us use their space, do you know? Well, I don't think it was a change of heart, Katie. Um, I know that at the, uh, that the Valor reporter reported that the Ice Center said no. I, I believe when Nick and I talked was that when, when we first, when I first approached yeah, board members, they were uh, positively disposed towards it. Nick talked at the board member's request to the uh, to the manager of the rink. The manager did have some concerns and was asking questions. We hadn't resolved it all by that meeting, but uh, Nick and I went down uh, to the ice center. I think it was two or three days after the meeting, mm -hmm. and we met with uh, three of the board members along with. I can't remember the rink manager's name right now. Jeremy. Yeah, Jeremy. We met with four people, including Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy had some questions and, you know, some concerns, uh, but I think we all, everybody answered them. They were on the same page. Uh, they came back to us and, and asked for uh, $250 a week uh, for, you know, so that they would be able to cover some of their expenses which I thought was a reasonable number. And, uh, you know, we were moving to come back to the board and say, yeah, that's probably something that we're gonna do. But, um, uh, we had, someone in the community had reached out to us about working with St. Leo's Hall. So in this, at the same time, uh, Nick was talking with uh, the folks there at St. Leo's. And when he looked at the, property, uh, they've offered us the use of the space and just told us uh, like a donation. Uh, that's what the Methodist Church does. I think we paid the Methodist Church a thousand dollars or something last year. So, you know, the, the money is not the issue. So anyway, it was nice that they offered and there's a possibility we may still ask the Ice Center if we might use the facility. There's a um, if there's a forecast for rain and, you know, we know that it's going to rain for a couple of days, if we can get in there and maybe show some movies, it would be nice. But I think that given that we're probably not going to be there uh, full time, that that probably won't work out because they're going to want to do some work on the facility and the like. So anyway, that's where we are. Oh, one real more quick question um, for this grant. Um, just talking about the ice center and these different facilities that we're going to have to operate out of that money will help go towards the additional cost of the setups of all that too as well is that correct yeah yeah okay yeah all right any more questions or comments here before we move to close this one out all right motion's been made and seconded all those in favor please say aye Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, it's not on the agenda, Chris. This could either be under um, recreation stuff or budget stuff, either way. Uh, we talked at the last meeting about the likelihood that the pool should be closed. Um, 
I spoke to Nick again before this meeting. The number of children that, or the number of participants that can be at the facility now has been raised from 10 to 25, but that still includes staff. Um, we're, we're coming up on the time where we're going to have to put money into the pool, um, you know, clean it, get new water in it, uh, do repairs to it. Uh, we're probably actually a little past that time. I, I would like to recommend to the board tonight that you just make a decision to close the pool for this year. We've already lost a number of lifeguards. Uh, we have a difficulty with staffing now because we, you know, they were, they were needing answers about summer jobs uh, last month. Um, 25 in the pool at any one time, including staff, that's kind of mm -hmm. limited to about 15 people. Um, our rec program won't really be able to use it because most of the participants are gonna be a long way away. Yeah, they could walk to the pool, but uh, they're not all gonna be able to be in the pool at the same time. I think the time has come where we should just say for 2020, the pool is uh, just not gonna happen. So I guess the first question I wanna ask is, uh, you just bring it to mind is, uh, if the summer happens to get hot or unusually hot, um, what means do we have to make sure that these children, you know, are protected from the heat, either through air conditioning units or sprinklers or, I mean, is there, has Nick thought about that as well? Um. I mean, I know some of these facilities are probably not equipped to. Yeah, they, we don't have air conditioning in, in any of them. If it really became, uh, you know, a blistering heat wave, we might have to just tell parents we, we can't take anybody today. Uh, the Wesley Church and the St. Leo's, uh, a lot of that is in basement space and, you know, that stays cooler. Right. Uh, uh, you know, we will have uh, Nick reported when he was here at the last meeting that uh, we're working with the uh, state park to have access to the center uh, state park facility and that we will and we're hoping to be able to offer swim lessons there and I know Nick is kind of planning now. It doesn't help on the spur of the moment to get cool, but he's trying to plan now where, uh, you know, parents might be told, okay, on Thursday and Friday next week, you drop your kids off at the, at the state park and, you know, you, we're going to use the waterfront for the camp for that day. Um, but I think we're just going to have to, like everything else, Chris, just, just kind of pay attention to what's going on. And if it's, if it really gets that hot that we have to worry about kids, um, you know, with heat stroke and stuff, we'll just have to, we'll have to cancel it for that particular day, I guess. Yeah, I just, I, you know, Memorial Day weekend was, uh, was a bear um, for a lot of people. And I'd just be concerned putting them in facilities that don't have adequate uh, means of keeping them keeping them safe so yep. okay <clears throat> so, so would you the motion make a motion close the pool then for the summer somebody that's please. staff's recommendation yeah hey bill real quick and, and what about the swim teams do they all know that this decision's coming and yeah i think this i think the swim teams have already canceled um there's there's no way they can meet those uh requirements mark okay Does that mean you're making the motion, Mark? Uh, I'll make the motion to close the Waterbury pool for the summer 2020 season. Somebody like to second that, please. Second that. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Any more comments, questions? Seeing none, all those who wish to approve, please say aye. Aye. 
Right. Chris, in response to your, I know you're concerned about kids, but there was a day back, back in the day when we were kids, there was no pools. People took them to the river and cooled off. Yeah, we were just allowed to go to the brook. My mom didn't, not that she didn't care, but. And even in the rec program, there's, there's the reservoir, you know, both the day use area and, you know, the one up by the campground. So, you know, even if we had to pay a few dollars to get them, you know, up, up to the campground area, that's probably worth it. Yeah. We'll figure it out. You will. Yep. Okay, budget up. Right. No, no. Thanks. Last item. Yeah, there's uh, there's really not much here unless you had questions. I did not, uh, you know, download this into an Excel spreadsheet and give you a, you know, projection for what the end of the year looks like. I just wanted to let you know where we were standing at the end of May. Um, on the budget, the big news I've already told you is that we, we have a grant to help uh, give us a little bit more revenue for the rec program. Um, we are 41% um, 40, of the way through the year, almost 42% of the way through the year. Um, we're about 19% of uh, expenditures. Uh, so our, you know, kind of reining in the spending has been working. Um, as I said, uh, the payroll, uh, it's uh, about 34.5% out of a 41.7% budget, but that's trending more steeply downward now because for the first 13, 15 weeks of the year, we were, we were normal. So the fact that we've kind of tipped it down by, um, you know, six or seven percentage points um, is, uh, is pretty good. Um, we don't have any real information on revenues yet at this point. Um, still working or trying to get information from the state legislature about what's gonna happen with regard to some of our big um, non-tax revenue sources that come from the state. The, the pilot, the uh, current use, the forest and parks reimbursements, and we just don't have information yet on that stuff. So um, I'm relatively happy where we are on the expense side of things. I continue to ask department heads to uh, be careful about spending. Uh, we did bump up the hours in the highway department. They've been working 20 hours a week, four of them. Um, I had Celia call one of the laid off uh, highway employees back uh, starting today and all the highway employees that are working are working 24 hours a week now instead of 20. So with one coming back for a full 24 hours and then four others, uh, 16 hours more for those four others. So uh, that's mainly to try to make sure we have uh, adequate staff to, to take care of the essentials on the highway and then get the the grass cut, the roadside mowing is is uh, begun this week now. Um, uh, actually, I think it started last week, middle of last week. So uh, we're still kind of moving in that uh, fashion. Um, my expectation with regard to the municipal office is maybe leave it as is for the month of June. We're starting to get a little bit of pressure from some of the professional folks, uh, surveyors, engineers, uh, certainly paralegals and lawyers to try to get in here, uh, to do some work. But I think we can leave the building as it is right now, maybe through the month of June. And Carol and I will be working together. We'll let you know, but be open. I think we'll probably, <laughs> go kind of in reverse order of what we did when we closed. Uh, we didn't just all of a sudden close the doors. 
opens the doors to the general public, but then allowed for appointment uh, uh, visits by appointment only by a specified class of people. So when we reopen, we will probably reopen to, um, to appointments only for those engineers or lawyers that need uh, information, mainly from the vault. We'll continue to monitor what's coming out of the governor's office and we'll see where we go from there. Um, as I said before, <laughs> um, keeping a handle on the expenditures is, I don't want to say as important as health, but from the perspective of whether we're open or not, the health aspect certainly is paramount. If there's no other issues with health, we've still got to be careful with how much money we spend. And the easiest way to do that is to continue to restrict um, hours that people are working. <coughs> the uh, employment benefits with the additional $600 a week that people are getting for unemployment. That extends through June 30th. So uh, the people who are out, uh, you know, I, I've talked to a couple of them. Most of them miss working. They miss uh, interacting with people not being harmed uh, too detrimentally. All of the people that we have laid off who have unemployment are receiving it, so that's good news on the financial front for them. So um, that's really it about the budget. Uh, I did send you the full balance sheet. We already talked about this at the beginning when we talked about the tax due date, but on that uh, first page of the balance sheet for Fund 11, I mentioned in my memo you know, as of Friday last week, we had $5,600 in the bank. We already borrowed about a million dollars in anticipation of taxes. The email from uh, Michelle, the bookkeeper today, we're gonna have to borrow another $100,000 tomorrow to pay uh, the bills that were processed this week. So that's where we are. If you have questions, certainly yeah, email me and I'll get back to you. Um. The only other question I would have would be um, the paving of Maple Street. Has that progressed at all, um, or is it kind of gone down the drain completely? No, no, no. We're we're still planning to do it. Okay. It, uh, it's you know uh, nothing different there. Uh, we have applied for a paving grant. I think it's very unlikely we'll get it. If we get it, we're going to have to seek bids from at least three um, vendors. Uh, if we don't get it, we'll just negotiate with ST Paving. I think that's our best option for right now. Uh, but that will happen, Chris. Uh, and it's not going to happen probably until uh, Labor Day-ish, but we'll get it done. OK, I, did, I just was curious if it had progressed in you know what the time frame was but uh if you're yeah. saying it's that far out then uh i won't pester you about it again yeah, no no there's no problem uh i know bill woodruff has met with the folks at st paving and i think he's met with the people from pipe now uh so we're getting at least two or two prices but uh st right now looks like the best bet but we're going to do that project and was, uh, I know at one point we talked about maybe doing some core samples. Is that still on, on the agenda or we kind of uh, nixed that? I, I don't remember. So core samples where? On Maple Street there because there's so many consistent, you know, frost heaves in that road. Um, we talked about having some core samples done to see what, might be causing it because my fear is that we're just gonna result in the same same thing after we pave over it again uh not that we can have the ability to yeah um i i, I have to check with bill woodruff on that 
My recollection was that was something Alec was going to look into, and, and Alec has been laid off right now. So I'm not sure. I, I'm sure we talked about core samples. Yeah, I remember I remember it now. Yeah. So I'm just curious. Yep. I'd, I'd like to know what they they think the problem is, just, just because, you know. A lot of money to put down on a road just to have turn around and have the same problem again. But we've done that for a lot of years with a lot of different roads, so. Well. Okay. Well, it was a good meeting. Um, the Zoom wasn't so bad. Uh, obviously, we'd all like to be sitting in the same room, but I guess playing the Jetsons is the next best thing <laughs> for the time being. So everybody have a good night. I take a motion to uh, adjourn if somebody'd like to. I have to one. Okay. I have one question before we adjourn, Chris. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Just a question for Carla. Um, I know I've had a few people ask, because mm -hmm. I, I know you're really good about doing, you know, notarizing documents. With the um, town offices closed, I assume you're not notarizing things for other than like, attorneys coming in or something like that for you know legal work no we're close to everybody I'm not okay any appointments we are not accepting any appointments so you're not accepting yeah I, I where can where can i if i get those kind of things do you know other notaries in the um in the community i've been referring people to one of the two banks for the drive through they have no okay they that's where I would have with the banks, but I didn't know with the drive-thru if they'll do it that way. Yeah, they are. I've heard that both okay. the Field Savings Bank and United Bank are. Does Kinney Drugs do notary services? I don't know. Okay, because a lot of drug stores have that service. Mm -hmm. So I had okay. one more one more quick question there, and then we can be done here. Bill, um, this is kind of aimed at you. Uh, the school budget vote, if a new new school budget vote comes to surface here, um, because of the COVID issue, um, what, happen, what happens if we get an uh, abnormal reduction in, in votes on this thing, on this new budget? I mean, if a, you know, a very small fraction of the people vote on a school budget how can how can something like that move forward unless you have a consensus from a, a you know at least a 51 percent of the well i don't think you're gonna come close to getting 51 percent of the uh, checklist to vote on on the school budget um i don't believe there's any quorum requirements chris uh, i know that uh you know, the old village of Waterbury, uh, they had meetings where they would, you know, seek authorization to borrow a half million dollars and uh, the, the trustees and the water commissioners and one member of the public were at the meeting and they voted from the floor and, and did it. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, if uh, one person votes and it's a yes, I think the budget passes, so. There are no quorum requirements. You can have 800 people at a town meeting, or you can have over 2,000 like we had in March because it was a primary. Yeah. But this vote, vote will definitely lower percentage for sure. That just seems wrong in, on so many fronts, but anyway. Okay. Is that it for everybody? Well, I know it seems wrong, but the old adage, you know, the decisions are made by the people who show up still holds. Yeah, no, that's if true. If it's that important to people, yeah. all they got to do is call up and ask for a ballot mail to them. It's yeah. not really that hard. Yeah, good point, Bill. Good point. Good vote. Okay, motion to adjourn then. All right, good night. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.